coming along. My name's Murray Woodman, and today I am going to be showing you how to personalize your website using a recommender as a service called Recombi. Uh, the topic of personalization is something that has uh, interested me for the last 10 years or so, um, where, where I was getting in sort of interested in collaborative filtering and collective intelligence. Um, but back then, you know, you had to write the code yourself. Uh, there was a lot of CPU required to sort of manage the data. And, you know, frankly, it was too much like hard work to write your own recommender as a service. But these days, it's different. Uh, Ten years have passed. There's a lot of uh, different services out there providing uh, these kinds of things. And Recombi is uh, a service that is very easy to use, and I'll be showing you how to use that today. But before we jump into that, I do want to cover a couple of areas. And the first one is that content management is essentially a solved problem. The things we're doing today in Drupal are very similar to the things we were doing 10 years ago. We were still managing content, doing, performing CRUD operations, um, doing, doing the presentation, and more recently, we've got uh, RESTful web services and uh, things such as JSON API. But really, things haven't changed so much. And in the marketplace, Drupal does have a lot of competition. Of course, there are other CMSs out there, and conferences like this are designed to make Drupal better to uh, compete against them. Um, but Drupal does have its strengths. And uh, in my mind, largely, this is based around uh, content modeling and uh, the ability for editors to be able to edit that content in a nice UI. Um, we've, we've got entities, we've got fields, we can perform relationships, and this is one of the things that really got me into Drupal all those years ago. And we've got JSON API, making it super easy to build uh, decoupled services. And of course, Drupal's great at doing integrations. So Drupal has a lot of strengths. We're in an excellent position to compete uh, in this uh, marketplace, but I think we really do have to start thinking about you know, how we put systems together to be relevant going forward. Furthermore, the CMS is only one part of the puzzle. I think as Drupal people, we probably think of problems in terms of a CMS and you know, what we can do with it and how we can solve these issues. But really, you know, there's a lot more pieces to the puzzle. This particular diagram uh, was created by a, a group of researchers called the Real Story Group. Uh, and a lot of their work you know, is, is quite good, and they sort of basically analyze the, the CMS market and, and other markets. You can see here that the, the web content management system, the green one, is just one part uh, of uh, you know, a number of different uh, engagement services. Uh, importantly, we have this thing called marketing automation that's uh, living alongside the web content management system. And this is an area which is, you know, being sort of exploding in the last 10 years. And, uh, you know, there are hordes of marketers out there doing marketing automation using tools, and they're not even thinking about a CMS. They're thinking about how to communicate with their customers, but the CMS is not necessarily the first thing they're thinking about. Um, but, you know, as we know, Drupal is very well positioned to, um, to act in that role, but we are facing a lot of competition from uh, marketing automation. As well, we have this sort of customer data backbone, uh, CDPs, where, uh, which is another area that's been flourishing in the last five years. And like all of these things are starting to build out um, content management services to help them operate, and that potentially is going to start competing with Drupal as well. So I think as Drupal people, when we start building sites, we need to shift our thinking. We need to th stop thinking about just publishing stuff out from one to many. We have to start thinking about communicating with people one to one. What do we know about those people? How can we personalize content for them? We also have to think about user experience not just being in the website. As we've seen, there's a variety of uh, sort of touch points there such as you know, mobile and social and email. Um, our users are communicating with our organizations on a number of platforms. And the user experience we're orchestrating has to operate across all of those. It's not just in the website. That's just what I said there. A lot of the, um, the smarts of the system and the way we are personalizing 
um, is going to be living outside the CMS. It could be living in a CDP or a, a marketing automation system. A lot of the decisions that are being made on how things are going to be personalized are not necessarily going to be happening in Drupal. I think in the Drupal world as well, we kind of got this dichotomous view of how we treat users. They're either going to be logged in and receiving a customized uh, experience with heavy page loads. And on the other side of the coin, we have um, you know, anonymous users where they're receiving pages that have been cached and are out on the edge. Uh, a decoupled way of thinking is certainly going to break down this um, dichotomy. But uh, you know, it's something that we really have to think about a lot. How can we provide personalized experiences for anonymous users? So I think to answer these questions, we really have to reconsider how we build out our systems. A lot of the ways we've thought about websites potentially have to change as we try to deliver these personalized experiences to anonymous people. So let's move on to personalization. Um, <laughs> I love this graphic. Thanks, Mady. Um, I think when we are building sites, we, you know, as Drupal people, we love modeling our data and our content. Uh, and of course, we have the user experience as well. We're defining different personas and different user journeys. And that will happen on a website. And we imagine how those users are, are flowing through. But I, I think there's a, you know, a third part of the picture here. I've called it marketing. It, it doesn't really mean that, but it really means sort of what are the users doing, what are they interested in, and how can we um, start talking to those users? And that bit in the middle, I think that's personalization. And for me, this is the most exciting part about web development these days, is how can we bring all of these things together so it, it forms a coherent picture and so that we can start uh, personalizing things for users. And it really requires design thinking around how do we model the content? You know, what do we know about the personas and the people who, who are accessing the site? And how can we take a data-driven approach to personalizing for these people? Now, these are all really big picture things, right? But today, I'm taking a much more uh, sort of smaller piece of the puzzle, one that we can solve. And that is to provide recommendations to users. I'm not going to show you how to build out a whole marketing stack. We're just showing you how to do recommendations to users. This will include um, recommendations to a user just in the general sense. Say they're on the home page and you want to show them some things relevant to them. As well as um, recommendations when a user is on a particular item. So that item is able to provide context, which is combined to provide recommendations to them. So introducing Recombi. Um, Recombi uh, bills itself as an artificial intelligence powered recommender as a service with an intuitive RESTful API and SDK, so I had to take a breath, tailored by data scientists. The, the really important sort of takeouts here is that uh, it's a SaaS service. It uh, has a really sort of friendly API to use and has got a lot of smarts behind it. It's scalable and it's doing some cool things under the hood that you don't necessarily have to worry about, but it's very easy to interact with. So how does Recombi do it? It does it in two main ways. Um, the, these are combined with a number of other uh, sort of strategies, but the, the main two would be collaborative filtering, and this is where we're tracking user behavior across a number of different users, and then providing recommendations. So if we have users that are similar and they like similar things, it's a fair bet that someone who is similar to those users is also going to uh, like the kinds of content that they like. In order to do this, we need to track user behavior on the site. So for example, this user has seen these individual items. And so as the user travels around the site, that stream of data is going across to Recombi. The second thing, uh, the second way that recommendations can be derived is by content-based mechanisms. And in this case, we're building up um, recommendations based on item similarity. So just say we have two articles, Article A and Article B, and they both share you know, similar tags and categories. Maybe the titles are similar. They're written by the same author. Obviously, they're going to be very similar. So Recombi is able to use these you know, fundamental properties of, a, uh, of your nodes or content to, to provide the recommendations. It's very similar to more like this with Solar. You, you may be familiar with that. Solar is taking a similar approach there where it's 
it's lining up the different facets and, and working out similarity. But in order for this one to work, we've got to get the data from Drupal over into Recombi. How do we do that? Well, we use their private API to, to push that stuff across. And a little bit later, I'll be showing a module that we've built at Morphed to uh, allow this to, to take place. So using Recombi on the client side, this is what it looks like. It's pretty simple. We're basically just tracking, uh, tracking things that a user is doing around the site. In this case, we're um, tracking a detail view. There are a number of other events you could do, like you know, someone purchased an item or someone saw a simple view. There's a few different events there. But essentially, we're just pushing over that user item interaction. And then getting the, the data back, we are saying, hey, Recombi, give me uh, five items there which are recommended for this particular user. So that, re that request goes to Recombi. A response comes back as JSON, and the callback there is able to handle that. If there's an error, that can be handled, and then the recommendations are there for you to consume. Generally, you would be consuming that JSON, converting it into HTML somehow with a template, and then writing that back down into the DOM. Okay, and this is you know, a little example payload here of some data that's, that's coming back. All of these values that we see have been pushed over into the uh, Recombi backend. And uh, you can see this is you know, be pretty easy to iterate through and build up your recommendations that have been gonna, going to be displayed on the website. On the server side, there's a separate API. You can see there's a private token there. That's basically a, a key just for your, your backend to talk to. Recombi, you do not want to have anonymous users using this because they're going to be able to mess up your database, essentially. So in, in this case, we have an example of us pushing um, the values of a, a node, let's say, over into uh, Recombi. And the, um, the code that we've written, which I'll just show you soon, is basically doing that to get that index over. So yeah, this is the module um, we've uh, built. Hats off to, to Veet, who's uh, written the code for this. Um, the module is called Search API Recombi. So we're using a Search API backend in order to get that data across. It may seem a little bit strange why we're using Search API. We're not actually doing any searching, but what we are doing is we're indexing the content. We're using the indexing abilities of Search API. So whenever a node is updated, the node index knows about that and it says to the back end, hey, go update this node and it gets pushed over into uh, Recombi. So yeah, so we're not using any search or facets. Once that data's in there, we can see it and we can access it via the Recombi API, just not through search or facets. A really, really cool feature we've built in is uh, support for federated indexes. So let's say you have a suite of marketing sites, sites alpha and site beta. They both can be pushing their indexes into the same index, uh, the back end at Recombi. And by getting these two into one, we are then able to do recommendations between both of the sites. And you know, this is a very, very nice feature because if you say you have a suite of marketing sites, and a user is only interacting on one, you can then start pushing content to them in another website and get them to jump across and start interacting with a, another marketing site. And essentially the way we do this is to um, send a site ID across into the index, which allows us to filter these things. This is what it looks like in the, the back end of Drupal. It's just a search API server we're looking at there. And you can see we have the Recombi back end and we just configure that up, the, the connection, and away you go. It's exactly like a, a database or solar backend. And this is what the data looks like when you are over in Recombi. You can see here I'm just filtering on Drupal, and we've just got a few IDs coming back. You can actually see we've got alpha and beta websites there on the, the left-hand side, so you can see we're indexing content from both sides. Um, this is where sort of like ontology comes in and getting your taxonomies right is super important. So the content modeling that you do up front in the research part of the project gets reflected in the, you know, the metadata we've got inside Drupal and how it is then stored in uh, Recombi. And the, the very important thing here, there's two important things with this. 
Firstly, Recombi is able to use this information to improve the item similarity. So it's able to look at these various columns and properties and work out the similarity for its recommendations. So that will improve the results you're getting back. And secondly, when you're getting that JSON uh, payload back, all of the data is there that you, you want. You don't have to hit Drupal to get the data back. So that's the background of uh, Recombi. I do want to say a few words on what I'm calling orchestration, and this is how do we bring this whole system together. Um, you know, when we sat down to sort of solve the problem of how can we get a, a nice, simple personalization system up and running, we, you know, we threw around a few ideas. You know, can we build, you know, a super module to, to rule them all? Or, you know, how should we get all this together? And we've basically said, okay, we're going to be using best of breed services and we're going to have them as being uh, loosely coupled. And this is going to allow us to provide personalization solutions that are going to be, you know, use the best of breed uh, services and, and bring them together in the way that we want. We didn't want to necessarily buy into a monolithic stack. Uh, this is an area where there's a lot of change. You know, there's a lot of new services uh, sort of coming up and you know, obviously people have different needs and, and different services they want to use. Um, we've taken a decoupled architecture as I've mentioned and also the solution is largely Drupal agnostic. So all of the code you're about to see, and there's not too much more, is will work on any site, right? It will work on Drupal, WordPress, a static site. The, the personalization um, approach we've taken will essentially work anywhere. The only Drupal stuff that we've seen is the, uh, the search API backend to, to help with indexing the data. And finally, we want it to be scalable. So whilst Drupal is going to be a super important uh, service for modeling the data and holding it, uh, we don't necessarily want to be hitting it every time. So that ability for a combi to give us a nice payload with everything there allows us to get a result to the page you know, in a couple of hundred milliseconds you know, as fast as possible because you want those results coming back quickly. And the way we've decided to do this is with Google Tag Manager. We didn't want to put JavaScript into um, the Drupal site or into the module or into a theme. We wanted it sort of sitting up outside and that's going to give us a lot more flexibility. Uh, the fact that it's sitting outside of Drupal opens it up to data specialists and to marketers and these kinds of people who may want to wire together solutions um, of their own. Um, Google Tag Manager's got an awesome environment. It handles things such as uh, you know, uh, revisions and uh, it's got variables and environments and it basically handles the asynchronous nature of uh, the internet with uh, you know, tag management where tags can fire after other tags, for example. So you can really you know, put together some quite sort of complicated things relatively easily. It is the glue between the systems and it basically is handling complexity. So we're not taking uh, like a no code or low code approach here. We are actually using code in the most efficient way and that's to wire the systems together because sometimes a few lines of code can you know, replace a whole heavy uh, system. So this is what the snippet looks like. We've tried to go as low tech uh, as possible. This is just this, you know, the solution that, that we're using, but eff effectively we have a div here with the combi class and we have a lot, number of data attributes that uh, can be used as parameters when they're getting passed through to uh, Recombi. Uh, in this case, we can see uh, some boosting components here where we can kind of boost certain topics if we want. Um, we've got a count of five for the results that are coming back. And we can filter out some sort of results that we don't want. And in this case, also filter just on site equals alpha. And finally, we've got the data type there saying, hey, we want some recommendations for a user. We've also got like a little handlebars um, template there in that script tag. Um, I, I know this is quite a sort of a, a, a basic approach, but it is a very flexible one. It's, it's a really low tech approach that's going to work in a number of environments. But this just gives uh, the site builder or editor a, a really quick and ready way to, to get in and sort of transform those results that are coming back. And essentially, this makes it very easy to mold 
uh, the, the HTML that's been produced into something that's going to work depending on what design system or, or theming system you're using. So that's the, that's the snippet. So basically that snippet's just going on the page uh, in a block and Google Tag Manager is going down and processing that and then accessing the Recombi API. Now, so time for the demo. I am going to assume a persona. I'm going to say I like the product of Drupal and uh, I'm in the, the um, developer audience. Um, we've got a suite of websites here, Alpha, Beta, and Sigma. Now, Alpha and Beta are like satellite sites. You can imagine them as little marketing sites. And then we also have a, the Sigma site, which you can think of as being like the mothership, the parent website, the, the corporate website that, that may want to know about what's going on. So we got these three sites, and I'm just going to come across uh, into the first of them. So yeah, these are really basic sites. It's just testing, guys. Um, they're not too polished, but basically we're using this as a proof of uh, concept of how, how all this stuff can work. So we've got the alpha site here, and this is one of the satellite sites. I'm just gonna show you the, the cookies that we've got in here so you, we can see that um, we've got Google Analytics in here, and this GA cookie here is the client ID. So this client ID that we're using is going to operate across all three sites. It's possible to set up Google Analytics to have a client ID travel across different domains, and that's what we've done in this case. So we've got a stable identifier operating across a number of domains, and that's, that's what allows us to, uh, to get that consistency. I'm just gonna remove um, all these cookies because we don't want those. I just wanna sort of start the site from a, a fresh start. So refreshing that there. Okay, so we've got the, the site now straight out of the box. We're getting some user recommendations back here. So this little user recommendations block down the bottom is what Recombi is trying to show to me now. Now this is a totally cold start. Recombi doesn't know anything about me yet, but what it is showing is some of the popular content, right? So when it's on a cold start and knows nothing about the user, it's gonna do its best and it's gonna show you some um, popular content. So I'm a Drupal developer, I'm just gonna click on that. So now I'm on the developing for Drupal page. And now we've got some item recommendations. So these node recommendations you can see here have been customized according to the, the node that we're on, um, as well as it's also taking into account um, you know, the, the content that I've clicked as well. So you can see the results here are, you know, seem to be pretty good. We've got some stuff for um, other developer ones. This developing for WordPress one might be cropping up because I have assumed the developer persona and this is a developer kind of um, article. So let's just click on a couple of other uh, recommendations here. Um, build your first Drupal site. Okay, so now we come back home and we have a look. I don't really know what's gonna show here. We've got some stuff on Drupal, some more Drupal -y stuff. Yeah, so okay, it knows I really like um, Drupal. So, you know, that's quite good. We're getting recommendations back about the alpha site. Now, if I come across to the beta site, remember I've cleared my cookies. This is the first time I've been on the beta site. It knows nothing about me. And I've come down here. And well, it's a little bit of a mix, right? But we've got some uh, Drupal, Drupal developer stuff, um, Drupal staff, Drupal, and another Drupal developer one. And it's probably throwing in this WordPress site because I, it knows I've clicked on certain developer articles. So you see a little bit of a, a mix there between um, Drupal and, and WordPress. And basically these are the recommendations that are coming back. So you can determine if you think that's successful or not, but uh, yeah, that's, that's what's coming back there. And if we come across to Sigma, remember this is the parent website. Um, basically, the, oh God, that's, that's really helpful. Oh, let's come back. Sorry, it's just a slow connection. Um, basically, we've got uh, some recommendations that are coming across both sites now. We're not just um, filtering, and you know, we can see that we've got some uh, recommendations from beta and from alpha. So I'm just having a look at where they're coming from. So we're getting some nice results there from both sites. So you could imagine if you had the parent corporate site 
you had a whole stack of marketing sites, you can then start pushing you know, people back down into these little sites. So this is the, yeah, the power of Recombi combined with the, uh, the power of um, you know, taking a federated approach. So that was the demo. Okay, so what have we just seen here? I think you know what you've seen, but we'll just cover it quickly. We've seen a single client ID generated from Google Analytics working uh, across a number of sites. We've taken a federated approach here, uh, so we've, we've proven that we can get it working across domains. Um, the recommendations have been very helpful because we've been able to, to sort of share users around those sites. And we've taken a decoupled approach with orchestration uh, going on in Google Tag Manager. And Drupal really hasn't been hit a single time. There's really been no load on Drupal whatsoever. So potentially, you know, you could, you could have, you know, hundreds or thousands of requests uh, coming through and, you know, should have a good chance of those being served. So the next steps, um, you know, this, this has been a really sort of interesting journey. We've been on it at Morphed, and what we've seen here with Recombi is a nice sort of starting position, but there's so many other things uh, we can do. Um, using the, the Google Tag Manager's approach, you know, there's uh, some yeah, interesting things. This first one, not so interesting, logging of events to analytics. But what you've done is once you've done your data modeling, your content modeling in Drupal, you've basically developed, you know, your taxonomies and you know I've got topics and tags and authors and um, audiences. Once you've done that content modeling, that can also be used to drive dimensions into Google Analytics. So I think we've got a lot of goodness sitting in our Drupal sites that we're just not indexing yet, right? We're just indexing page views. Why aren't we indexing all of the dimensions as well? So when you start thinking about this kind of stuff, Google Tag Manager is a great way to do that. Also, uh, that little example you saw with the snippet, it would be trivial to sort of rejig that to, to start getting content out of Drupal. So if, let's say we've pulled down a, uh, you know, a, a user profile and we know this user is interested in something. We can easily be doing requests to a JSON endpoint in Drupal and pulling that content out. So this is the concept of using Drupal as a content hub, you know, which can be serving you know, different platforms, not just Drupal sites. Um, Google Tag Manager has also got the data layer. This is a really important part. It's very simple, but basically it's a place where you can put data, and when that data lands in there, certain triggers can fire in Google Tag Manager to do stuff. So it's a great place to, you know, basically sort of manage the state of a certain page request. And, uh, you know, once you've sort of decided that that's the way it's going to work, a decoupled architecture can be sort of, you know, Google Tag Manager can just be listening out for changes that have happened to, to fire off other things. There is a Drupal module called the Smart Content Module. Now, we've done a, a few little experiments with this, and I think this is a sleeper module. Uh, it doesn't have so many installs, but I think it's going to be, uh, potentially become very important for people that want to do personalization. It will allow you to do conditional logic client side and display blocks depending on the outcomes of that logic. So you could say, if the user has this preference, you know, display this particular block. So this is how we can do personalization for anonymous users. We've got to move that logic into the client side, and a module such as the Smart Content module should allow us to, to do that. Another amazing thing is something called affinity. And this is the propensity for an individual to like certain things. Um, so for example, a person might like a certain author, or they might like the color red, or be interested in a certain topic. Now when someone's cruising around your site, they're really just looking at pages. We don't actually know the kinds of things they're interested in. We're just logging the pages. So how can we work out what someone's interested in? Well, I think the, the capabilities of Recombi can be used to do that. Um, we are, after all, indexing page views, but why don't we start indexing the subject matter that people are actually looking at as well? And once we've done that, I think we can start deriving affinity for, for uh, what users have for what kinds of subject matter they're interested in. 
And once we have that information, we can query Recombi, say, get me back the affinities for this user, and then we can push them up to a CRM. So we can say, this user is really likes color red and this particular author and Drupal as a, a product and uh, developer as an audience, let's just say. All those four different facets can be pushed up into a CRM. And then the, then the CRM knows about this user. And this is the principal point. Once you have done that, you know about that user at the time that they engage with you. So as soon as they sign up for your newsletter or download an ebook or something like that, you get that email address, goes into the CRM, you say, hey, Recombi, give me the affinities, up they go, and then you send out your first email to them. And that first email is going to know all those four things about them. They know that they're a Drupal developer and they like the color red, and you can start having a personalized conversation with them the first time uh, you've met them. I think that's pretty much the holy grail of what marketers are looking for these days. So yeah, that was essentially what we were trying to solve when we went and started this path at Morph, looking at personalization. Uh, it is an active area of research for us, and we're really looking to work out ways that we can come up with cost-effective ways to do this personalization. Um, and yeah, we are looking to build out integrations with other services. We've seen that we're using Recombi. I've mentioned sort of CRMs and email uh, marketing, but that would be the next thing. It's like pushing that data back up into a data store where we sort of know about that user. Um, the example we've seen, that's just a, a proof of concept, and we've proven that we've been able to get this to work. We're really looking for people to work with, though, so we can um, sort of make the most of it. So if you have a project you think will be benefit from it, please get in touch. So, yeah, in conclusion, wrapping up, we've seen that personalization is at the nexus of content, UX, and marketing. And in order to you know, approach these problems, we've got to sort of take uh, a flexible approach so we can wire the systems together. Recombi is really easy to use, just a couple of lines of code. And with that, that Drupal module, it allows us to index in stuff very easily as well. Google Tag Manager is a great way to have a, a really flexible and pragmatic way of, of wiring it together. And basically, we've sort of designed a platform agnostic solution here. So, you know, it can easily work for your Drupal projects, but also other places. Before I go, though, I do have a rallying cry for all of us in the room. And that is coming back to my initial point about the landscape changing. We've basically seen the rise of the CMO. Marketing budgets are getting bigger, and marketers are deciding what technology they're going to be using. And increasingly, this means looking at uh, you know, automation systems where the CMS is not necessarily foremost in their mind. We know we've got challenges from in the CMS space, but also uh, from CDP, CRMs, and email marketing. Just last week, MailChimp announced that they are having a, we uh, a website builder. The week before that, Salesforce said that they've got a website builder. So we can see these other systems, they're getting into the content game as well. And where is that going to leave Drupal? If Drupal's not uh, addressing these problems, we're just going to be a CMS doing CRUD operations. And the challenge is, how can we get out of that? So I think Drupal needs to leverage its strengths. It's content modeling and JSON API are two core things that we can use. And I think um, if we do that, we're going to remain relevant. For the Drupal developers out there, when we're talking about decoupled, I think decoupled is often combined with the concept of decoupling the presentation from the data in Drupal. But really, decoupled is much bigger than that. It's taking a data-first approach and thinking of how can we build systems that are using data in a decoupled way. So don't just think of it as presentation. Think of it as how can we put systems together where Drupal's playing a really important role in providing that data. And I think if we do that, Drupal will find a place as a first-car citizen in uh, the marketing stack of the future. And that's it. Thank you very much, everyone. All right, 34 minutes, 10, oh, so it's only five minutes for questions, but that's great. We've got a little bit of time for that. Thanks, Mary. That was, uh, that was great. Hey, uh, two questions quickly. In that demo that you showed us, where is the master source of data? Where are those? The data starts in Drupal. Okay. Which one of the three sites? 
Oh, all three, so the, the Alpha and Beta had their own content. Alpha had like 20 articles and Beta had 20 articles. Oh, okay. So they're actually living in different sites and then they're getting pushed over into one index in yeah, Recombi. Okay, okay, um, great, cool. So the other question is, um, <clears throat> where you, do, you, do you see or can you imagine any weirdness where you've got uh, a user account logged into the site? Uh, and, and what does it look like when the two systems need to kind of like tether together and work? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, we've used the, the, the client, the Google Analytics client ID, but you could easily use a, a Drupal ID as well if that user is logged in. So in Google Tag Manager, you could say, hey, look, this user's logged in. I'm going to use that user ID rather than the, the client ID. Of course, you've then got hassles around, you know, working out, oh, I've got a client ID for this user, and now I've got a, a yeah, Drupal yeah. ID, and you have to work that out. And products such as CDPs and things like that are sophisticated to handle that, that system. Yeah, I'm, I haven't addressed that. But you could definitely use other methods to get the, the user ID um, in. Yeah, right. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, just a quick question. So obviously, uh, the recommendations that are coming back are um, triggered by a click on the page. Are there other, are other metrics that are um, considered, such as time on the page and bounce rates and that kind of thing? Well, so there are a number of events that you can track in that system. So we saw the detail view. You can kind of, I don't know what it's called, it's got a simple view or maybe an add to cart or a purchase. So there's probably about four or five different uh, events that they're tracking in Recombi. So yeah, that is, that, but I mean, you could write JavaScript in to listen for those events and send individual clicks. But yeah, they're not recording integers of seconds on a page. And I certainly know that there are many uh, sort of CDPs and things like that out there that do, and you know, other optimizing software that do look at time on page to work out if someone's actually engaging. And then that, that seconds on the page will lead to an engagement score that is getting scored. But Recombi's just doing, you know, you don't even know, but they're just doing yes, no on, on those different ones. So the answer is no, but um, some systems do. Yeah. Uh, another question, how do you, are there any smarts in what it recommends? Because sometimes you go on Amazon and you pick a white shirt and then you go to Google search and it recommends you white shirts. It's like, okay, I already have a white shirt, thanks. <laughs> how do you prevent uh, repetitive. Yeah, that's, uh, that's good. And um, it's so funny, two days ago I was up to midnight trying to debug that very thing. Where I was going in and clicking a whole lot of Drupal links and it kept giving me word print, WordPress results back. I was like, what's going on? This is not going to be good for the conference presentation. Ah. And then, then I worked out that it was actually not showing me results that I'd already seen. So it was taking out pages that you had seen and then giving, it was giving you back developer results. Not, so I was kind of getting good results back, and it was removing the things that, that I, I had seen. So it, it is trying to avoid that problem of just repetitively doing it. And I wouldn't mind betting that they're kind of throwing in the odd random bit of weirdness for, um, oh, what's the word? I forget what the word is, but you know, the, the, the fifth result is going to be like a, an outlier to, so you're not getting stuck in an echo chamber. I think Amazon do that as well. They'll, they'll give you some nice results and then give you a, a random or a slightly randomized one so you're not just stuck in that, that little world. And it's probably doing that, but I'm not really sure. But there's also many other strategies that you can um, uh, fine tune inside Recombi. So you, you can say, I want you to weight popularity or I want you to rate weight recentness and things like that. So you're able to kind of fine tune a little bit by saying what strategy it should adopt when getting those results back. You said you need to build the taxonomies to deal between systems, right? Which color they prefer or what topics. How do you handle the taxonomies between different systems? Yeah, because right. Like the color red in Drupal yeah. might be term ID or... Yep, that's right. And so when, when you saw the, the back end of um, uh, Recombi, you would have seen that were machine names and human readable. So basically, I've got a key field on every taxonomy term. So uh, if the red would be color colon red. 
and that is what we're indexing into Recombi. So, we, we're, so there's, a, yeah, there's a stable identifier that, that we're using between the sites, exactly right, yes. For other, for other clients, we've written little sort of ontology sync things. So if you, you update an ontology in one, it gets synced over to another. So we're keeping the ontologies in sync between sites. So, you know, so that's like a little bit of a thing you can do to try to keep that stuff in sync when you're trying to have a federated system. But yeah, you're right. You, you must have stable identifiers across all three, and node IDs or term IDs are not going to cut it. You have to, you have, to have a... Um, a, a name like that. Now we've chosen a human readable name because we're able to write little queries to filter on that or if you're going into Google Analytics and, and storing it as a dimension, people working in Google Analytics are going to want to know what that name is as well. So, it, you know, it makes sense to have it. Going with UIDs doesn't help. Oh, you could. I mean, it, well, not if you're trying to do federated, right? And, and not if you really want to understand what's going on. Like when you look in the back end, it's going to be pretty confusing to see a whole lot of uh, yeah, long IDs that don't have any meaning to a human. But, it, you know, the system would still work. It's just going to be harder to understand. Yeah, yeah. What do you guys think about this whole decoupled thing as well? You know, it's a bit of a challenge to the it's community the future, there. Murray. Stop asking questions. Okay. All right, come on. Hey, um, um, sorry, this is a bit off topic, and I see there's a couple of other questions, so we'd rather talk about it drinks after. Um, <clears throat> out of interest, uh, what, what we, we all get this, this is really cool, but what, what's the sort of the response been from, from your customers? Do they, do, they, do they just sort of like give you enough guidance that you can, you can work with them? Uh, it's very early days, it must be said, right? So this is, yeah, work, work that we've just, you know, completed in, you know, the last sort of month or so. So, yeah, we've, we've got the proof of concept there. We've got it on uh, the Morph website there and, you know, maybe the site's getting a little bit more sticky and keep, pe keeping people on. I, I will say one thing, though, and um, I think in terms of return on investment, if you're running an e-commerce store or something like that where you have a dollar value, it's going to be much easier to say, hey, I'm getting good return on your investment for engaging us here because your sales have gone up a certain amount. Um, I think in the Drupal world, we, you know, maybe we deal in education, uh, you know, uh, you know, publishing and government. In these kinds of industries, we're really publishing content more, so it's harder to get a dollar a dollar value on that, but I, I think the metric has to be, you know, time spent on site or, you know, conversions and, and those things. So you probably have to have a metric that's going to work for you. Have you tested it with do not track Google? Yeah, analytics? and th that's right. So, uh, you know, this is a really big thing. So like the Safari browser has got this sort of feature now that cookies that have been created client side are going to be deleted after seven days. And so this is I'm not really up to, totally up to speed with it, but it could be a game changer for this whole marketing automation world if, the, if browser companies are deciding we're going to go, uh, yeah, destroying those cookies. So, yeah, this is like an ongoing battle. I think even if you had seven days of data, though, and the, the user joined up, you still, you still know a little bit about them. But, yeah, it's definitely uh, an area that is, you know, potentially putting approaches such as this under, under threat. It would work. You said one of the first slides when you choose in, like the similarities between different users. If you would lose the data about specific identifier in seven days, but you would have the same behavior of the same person after that, right? And then you can... Yeah, manage. yeah, yeah. So we're just talking about that Google client ID getting destroyed or something like that. I, I look at look, Apple's kind of competing with Google on this and saying, we don't like your advertising models. We're going to punish you and delete your cookies so your whole business model goes down the drain. That's, that's how I see it a little bit. But if that Google client ID is disappearing, it's going to make it harder to, to track. But there's, there's other ways to track. Or you just say, OK, that's the browser the person's using. I'm just going to accept that. If they want to destroy the cookies, fine. I'm not saying doing anything nasty. We're just using accepted approaches. And people want to delete their cookies, that's great. You know, they've, they've got their privacy. So I, I don't want to come at it from a, a nasty angle. We want to respect what the user wants there. Tried it on a couple of sites. How do you think it would go on, say, 300 or something? <laughs> <laughs> do you think it's scalable? Um, or is that something you want to test out? And the second question that I've got is well, we've tried this a few times in government, and I'd be willing to play around and join up and, and see what we could do. One of the things that determines whether we would touch this in government is how much control 
we would have over the tuning, and I'll tell you two good examples why. Um, if you put in on a government website or in Google, death, often what you'll get back as a government response is taxes, the death duties, oh, right. um, taxes, finalising estates, uh, public trust. Often the user is typing in death because someone's just died, and the user experience they want is assistance with funerals, mm -hmm. um, uh, bereavement counselling. So quite often in the past we fine-tuned what the user will see knowing that one word can have a number of different flavours and knowing what the general public is actually trying to find. Mm. So that's why sometimes waiting can work in that instance. The other one is the ability to make certain topics uh, not tracked. Yeah. And the one we obvi quite obvious, and I think most of you are already aware of this, is domestic violence topics. Yeah, yeah I've, no seen, I've seen those, yeah. Yep. yep, so we don't want yep. those cookies to come back up Mm. When somebody else in the family's on the computer. Yeah, that's a good um, point. So, so those are the little intricacies of doing it in a government context and also not being spooky, which is the number one thing. But it's quite interesting. And I think you think about GovCMS and the amount of sites that are sitting under that single Google identifier and how easily someone can come into the wrong part of government. And if we could just let them know, hey, I think you might be looking for this. These, these things are really interesting to us. Yes. But we're taking baby steps into it because of the things that can go wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I wouldn't mind playing around with it. Yeah, cool. Well, so, yeah, a few questions there. I mean, that what you were seeing there, we are on the super baby free plan because obviously there's no traffic there. So you can, yeah, that's free if you've got low traffic. And, you know, it should, I can't really attest to how scalable it is, but it's got a very scalable architecture, you know, behind it, you know, it's dealing with millions of, you know, re requests, uh, recommendations an hour or something like that. So um, I, I think it should be able to, to handle the scale, but, you know, that ultimately that's Recombi um, doing that. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then on the other stuff, yeah, do not track. So the, the, the great thing is in Google Tag Manager, you could, you know, basically say, oh, if this page has got anything to do with domestic violence, I'm not going to track it, right? So you could just have a little flag on the page, like do not track. And then when that page loaded up, Google Tag Manager could say, is that do not track um, value on the page? Okay, I'm not even going to track this page. So that's the great thing about Google Tag Manager. It's like, yeah, you know, you can just code that in and um, that will just be a, a conditional uh, to show that. Um, but yeah, this is just coming back with recommendations. It's, it's not doing custom logic, like display this block to this person if they, they're that. It's, so yeah, the results you get back are going to be dependent on what they've done. So it's a little bit random, right? So you're not really sure entirely what it's going to do. When I do talks, I always love the questions, right? I'm so nervous before, and then I get to the end, and I'm all happy. So just keep firing them if you want, guys. <laughs> or talk to me after. Yeah. All right, I think that's pretty much it. Thanks a lot, everyone. <laughs>